Hi, I'm Rob Hartnett. On the Art of the Possible podcast, we aim to inspire, entertain, and educate you in all areas of leadership and leading a life full of possibility. We speak with people who inspire by their actions and their attitudes and cover a wide range of personal and business topics that are relevant for today. The Art of the Possible podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, the John Maxwell Team, Extended Disc Behavioral Assessments, and Selling Strategies International. You can find out about all these brands and more at robhartnett.com. And now, let's get on with the episode. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on this new episode of The Art of the Possible, I am speaking with the guru of sales marketing for small to medium businesses, Mr. Michael Haynes. Michael, how are you? Very good, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have you, my friend. Now, Mark, you're an avid traveler and and you're in Sydney, but you didn't start in Sydney. Where, where, how did you get to Sydney? What's happening with all that? So how, how do I get to Sydney? That's a good question, Rob. So yes, I do love to travel. And so I finished my MBA uh, way back in 1997, so I can start doing the math there. Um, had some time for my first uh, role, came here to Australia for four months, made some great friends down in Melbourne and uh, now, and some of which are now up in Coffs Harbor. And one of my good friends, Josh said, Michael, you boys want to work overseas. I'm gonna get you down here and put me in touch with a migration consultant here in Sydney and um, came here in 2000 and I've been here ever since. So you came uh, for the Olympic games? I, I arrived here, I was working for a dot com and it just so worked out that I arrived two months before the Olympic Games. Uh, Rob, I'm a massive athletics fan and I had three friends trying out for the Olympic team that year. None of those three made it. So it was a bit of irony because they're like, Michael, we have been training <laughs> to go to the City Olympics. We're not going and you're going to be there. So it was a little bittersweet. Uh, yeah, so it just worked out. Uh, so where's, where's hometown for you? Where, where did you... Um, my hometown is Toronto, Toronto, Canada, on beautiful. the East Coast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I was just watching a, uh, a series on Toronto last night. It is uh, one of the great um, architectural cities of the world and, uh, and one of the fastest growing as well, too. Toronto has got some amazing architecture and skyscrapers and all sorts of stuff that's going on there. So as has Melbourne, funnily enough. It's actually, yeah. they featured Melbourne and Toronto. Who would have thought? Yeah. yeah. Um, they do have some similarities, Rob. Yeah. They do. Yeah. And no, that's, that's fantastic. So we've got you down here. So that's, that's a big win for us. I think that's a big, big win for us having you down here. So that's awesome. Love being here. So it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And coming since 2000, I was in a dot-com too uh, back in those days too, Michael. So we share those amazing experiences of the dot-com. Although I, I feel the era, I mean, we'll talk COVID a bit later on, but I think the era, it's similar. You know, you know, I don't know if you get that feeling, but I get a similar kind of buzz around uh, around the internet again, around the yes. way we're working now than, than those Absolutely. kind of heady days of, of the dot-com era, which were uh, you know, very exciting. Yeah. Um, now tell me, the Art of the Possible is the name of this podcast. I'm going to throw a word at you. What does the word possibility mean to you? Uh, the word possibility uh, for me, Rob, means lots of opportunity, that anything is feasible. And while we are in some very interesting times, I do think it does present uh, opportunities and possibilities for many people, not for all. Um, I don't like to use that word pivot too easily because it's easy for some of us who are knowledge-based workers, service providers. Uh, it is easy for us to pivot, to make that, or I prefer to call business innovate, um, but, but it's not feasible for everyone. But uh, possibility, yeah, what's feasible um, and lots of opportunity. And there yeah. are opportunities that are here, even in these times that we're in. Absolutely, silver linings. I uh, I define possibility as where um, opportunity and optimism meet. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I think that you, you've got to have the op optimism, but where there's an opportunity, then it's all of a sudden, wow, hang on, yeah. that's possible. That that could that could work. And I would also add to that, Rob. Um, positive mindset too because I think to take advantage of those opportunities you need to be optimistic but you have to have that growth mindset. So you need to have that growth mindset and also to be action oriented as well. Yeah, I like that. I was um, watching something with Marcus Buckingham, the guy who wrote Strengths Finders, um, and he said that he said that pessimism is the opposite of leadership. And I thought that was a really interesting yeah. quote, isn't it? So, yeah, in terms of you think about self leadership and what you're doing, you have to if you're self leadership and you're little, and especially if you're leading a team in a business, you, you have to be optimistic about the future. There's not blind optimism, but you have to be optimistic that that things will improve, will find a cure for, for COVID, things like that. And he said, you know, pessimism is the opposite of leadership. And I think it's probably true. I think that's yeah. nice to reflect upon that. I actually don't know of you know an elite sportsman uh or an entrepreneur of a successful person that's actually a pessimist i, I don't know i don't know if you do but i i can't yeah. think of any that, so that's that, a very good point you've raised no i don't i can't think of one either now that you mention it yeah yeah text me afterwards if you do but i can't <laughs> find one <laughs> hey i love the name that uh, a lot of the taglines of your business so listen innovate 
grow. Fantastic. How did you come up with that? And what does that mean to you? So listen, innovate, grow. So those are the three fundamental things that every business and going to be talking in the context of our piece. So, you know, small, medium businesses, those are the three fundamental things you need to do if you want to acquire, retain, grow business customers and have a sustainable business. Uh, how that uh, name came to being is when I was working on the book, Listen, Innovate, Grow, with my colleague and good friend Gareth Chandler, as we were doing the research and as we were taking a step back and looking to say, well, what is it that makes SMEs and startups successful and have sustainable businesses? We were able to really distill it down into Listen, Innovate, Grow. So those are the three fundamental things that startups, SMEs need to be doing. And we've created a framework around that. But those are your fundamental underlying activities that your business needs to be doing all the time. And now in these times, more than ever. And, and tell me about listen. Who are you listening to? Sure. Great question, Rob. So you need to be listening on three levels. First, you need to be listening to you. So that's about listening to your company. So understanding what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where is the business winning? Uh, what are the goals and missions and vision for the leadership team for the organization? So that's listening to you. Then secondly, you need to be listening to the market. So you need to be understanding for those industries, those geographic markets that you're operating in, you know, what's happening within that space. What are you hearing amongst your colleagues? What's going on with your competition? So that's very much around listening to the market. And then the third area that where you need to be listening is listening to customers. Now, in business to business, where you have buyers and users are not one and the same, it's not enough to just be listening at a company level to understand what the Commonwealth Bank is doing, what Qantas is doing. You need to understand for your product or service, who are the buyers, who are the decision makers, and those are the people that you really need to be tapped into and listening to them to understand their priorities challenges, what are their drivers, what are they trying to achieve, and then everything you do within your business really must speak to the needs of the decision makers and not just users. It's a subtle distinction, Rob, but very critical and vital in the business. Yeah, I, um, I 100% uh, agree. I like that one. I think there's that big distinction between listening and hearing. You know, so you're, yeah. are you listening with intent to, to really understand as opposed to I'm hearing stuff, but I'm really just hearing noise because I just want to talk. So I think that's important. I think that was a great point you made. I think the other point, I really like it, uh, Mark, when I struggle with people to understand this, but you and I are of similar, similar thought. Um, when people say to me, you know, who's the, who's the decision maker? And you know what, you know, in B2B, there's lots of decision makers, right? There's lots yeah. of, now there's someone who has a final decision, yeah. uh, you know, what I call, what I call the final approver. Yeah. But there is a lot of decision makers who decided on a, I love that point on yours, that, you know, has it worked for me in the way I use this product or service? Uh, other ones decide on has it, is it compliant? In other words, does it fit for me from a risk mitigation perspective? Yeah. And there's others who decide on a fiscal point of view. They're all, they're all decision makers. So I always find it fascinating when someone goes, well, I only talk to the, to the decision maker. And I go, well, you just probably missed four other people, right? So, who could sink the deal you know so i think that's a great awareness too i love that you, you can't listen at a corporate view because literally a Qantas or a cba or any organization is just a abn entity with a number people make up it's people that make the decisions inside the cba Qantas. we're talking large businesses but the smaller businesses it doesn't matter does it it's all about people it's, it's absolutely all about people. And there are multiple decision makers now. I think on average, I think prior to this pandemic, I think the, according to the research, the average number was around uh, five to six. Now in your large organizations or your big corporates, your uh, large government organization, it can go up to anywhere from eight to up to a dozen people. And you need to be tapping into and understanding who are those decision makers as well as those influencers. So as you quite rightly pointed out, Rob, it could be people from finance, compliance, risk. Procurement is getting an increasingly important role and having a strategic role as part of that decision-making process. You have to identify all of those people, understand their priorities, drivers, motivations, and that's what you need to be doing in terms of engaging and marketing to them. I'm going to put marketing in quotes. Yeah. Those are the people that you really have to be zoning in on uh, so that you can uh, help them meet their requirements and move them along their buying journey, which is not a linear process by any means either. No, I 100% agree. It's, it's interesting. I'll be a little contrarian with you, though, because I think in COVID what's happened is those people are still, uh, I think all that numbers are still there. But what I have seen just during the COVID period was that um, the decision making, the final approval um, actually went about two layers higher. 
right? So it, it went up to level simply because people said, hang on a second, if we're going to spend money, we better be spending money in the right areas. And so a lot of people, you know, went up and sometimes that went out of the country. Sometimes it went to a local regional area and sometimes at a global level. Uh, and so, so, so sometimes the, the level of the if Durani became three really important people just during COVID because they just decided you know, no one else is making a decision by these three people. And so I, what actually I saw happen was they got less numbers through that period of people who could really decide. But those people became very prominent and the sales cycle went longer or is going longer because those three people, one, are hard to get to. But secondly, they're not subject matter experts. And yeah. so I was speaking to a COO who so told me, I'm, a, I'm making decisions on stuff I don't know a lot about. But because of my COO role, the CEO has determined that things need to go past me. Yeah. Have you seen well, that? Yeah, uh, Rob, I think you've, you've, nailed, you've nailed a very important point because in this environment right now and moving forward, what businesses, what business buyers, what decision makers are looking for is decision making confidence. They want to have confidence as to you know, what decisions to be making and how to take the businesses forward. And this is what many decision makers are struggling with because they're getting inundated with so much information you know, from webinars, white papers, uh, you know, thought leaders. And so there's this sea of information that they're getting and they're trying to distill through that to work through based on what their organizations what trying to do how do they best move forward so now there is that hesitation and longer cycles because they want to get that consensus they want that confidence that validation so there might only be three people but they might be spending a lot of time each uh, going through their respective information sources talking to their colleagues and trying to gain that consensus and to get that internal certainty as to moving forward so that decision making confidence is exactly what is is businesses are looking for. And that's why you're finding there's that high level of risk averse amongst business buyers uh, today. Yeah, I think that's a great point. In fact, I saw a stat, Michael, recently from Gartner that said uh, in B2B um, that the B2B buyers, they rated the kind of information they're getting, right? Um, the materials from the webinars and the like. And they, they rated, it was like 88% said, we're getting really good stuff. Like it's all good, right? And what happened was that, they're then going, it's all good. This is not helping us. It's all good. We, we, we're actually getting really good, diverse opinion, but we've got so much coming at us now. We need someone to do some sense making here. We need someone with some wisdom here. We need to get, you know, that, that confidence. And it's almost a bit like, you know, you don't get sacked from buying from IBM, that old line that you and I yeah, be familiar yeah, with. But, yeah. but at the point that almost going, so, that, so that for the challenger brands, it's actually even harder now because they're like, wow, everything's really good. Maybe we'll just stay where we are for the next 12 months. Maybe we'll just, instead of jumping from the fire, you know, to the, from the fire pan to the fire, we'll, we'll kind of just retain. So for those, I find those challenger brands, it's really, you know, it's a lot more work you have to go to than now to get someone to actually shift away from an incumbent. Have you, have you found similar things? So Rob, yes, I have found some more things and you've raised a very important issue that the role of selling now has completely changed. So it's not show up and throw up. You need to be one of an advisor and a consultant and you need to, to provide the implementation roadmap. You need to be going in as the advisor and to be helping and working with your client with that prospect to help them distill all of that information and help them determine what is the roadmap of what they should be doing and how they're going to be getting there. That is the role that you need to be doing now. And those that are able to uh, be that facilitator, to have to instill what I call buyer enablement and provide that roadmap, that is how you succeed. Uh, with respect to your comment around challenger brands, uh, you've raised another very good point there. And a key part of that selling as part of that advising and creating that roadmap, you have to leverage insight and uh, research insights and facts and demonstrate why change? Why do you need, need to change now? What's the cost of inaction? How are you going to get there? And ultimately, why you as that product or service provider? So the, the, the game of the, the nature of B2B selling is really about being that advisor, uh, roadmap uh, architect, uh, and solution provider and executioner. It's all about facilitating and developing that roadmap and working with your clients. So it's really changed the nature of B2B selling now. Yeah, and I, and I really like, I'm going to bring you back to your first point, which I thought was an absolute ripper, which is you've got to give that buyer confidence. You know, that's that buyer has for. got to have confidence. And, I, and what I really like about that, and I'm advising you know, a number of people, someone was talking to me yesterday about uh, team selling in B2B. And I said, it's never been more important to team sell. 
to not only bring in, you know, not only have just a lone wolf salesperson, which you know I think is going away a little bit, but you must do it now and bringing in that 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 team. And I really like your point when you said, "Here's the roadmap," because. And the client once said to me, I remember winning a, a large piece of business a few years ago in my IT days. And he said, you know, Rob, he said, our relationship starts when we sign the order. Yeah. It doesn't end. That's, that's, we've been building up to it. We are starting our relationship. And it made such an amount of sense to me. And from that point onwards, when April sold, I rolled out how this will look like when you buy from us. And I know and they Rob, haven't bought from us. You know, what's and the Rob, map that's look missing like? link. You've nailed it right there. That's a missing link, which many B2B sellers, they are focusing on the sale. But the critical question is what happens after the sale? Yes. And it is those as you've already nailed and are doing already, when you map out and say what happens after the sale, that's how you win. That's how you instill the decision maker yeah. confidence. And it will present an opportunity for us SMEs that are the challenger brands. Those that can do so will win in the big end of town because there is a lot of uh, dissatisfaction uh, amongst many big business buyers in big corporate because, you know, that whole adage of no one gets fired for hiring IBM, those days are over. Rob, I got my first gig um, as an independent consultant because a big consulting firm, which shall remain nameless, did a segmentation study that was absolutely rubbish. And this uh, senior director said, well, Michael, you can't do any worse than how much I paid <laughs> on this. Right. And he refused to tell me how much he paid. Or, and it was because of that he wanted someone, you know, he wanted a team that would be niche and it's going to deliver, that's going to really work with them and give them what they need at the quality and specificity. So it's, it's all about providing that roadmap. What happens after the sale? Yeah. That's a critical question you must answer. I think that's a great one, Michael. And you can leverage your team. And even if you've got a small um, business, um, and, and even if you're a single business, you know, the way, way I did that in, in the small teams was my, um, my pre-sales and post-sales people who are not frontline sellers, but are part of the sales process. And I think that's one thing I find missing in many SMBs is they, they, they hire a salesperson. Or I think the sales team's that well, they may well be the frontline, but everybody is part of the sales process. And so if you, and, and those pre and post sales people were fantastic because I would introduce them. So if you've got someone who's once you've won the piece of business, you've got a customer service person or the, the yeah. new buzzword customer success now uh, person, introduce them really early on, right? Just, you don't have to sell, but just say, hey, the, the, here's my roadmap. Here's the people you'll get to meet. Who should they meet? And I find it's a great way of actually finding out other decision makers, Michael, in the business by saying, I, I go first. So here's my implementation manager. Who should they talk to? Who, if, we were to if we were to work together, who would they meet? And all of a sudden, I, I uncover somebody else I didn't even know was it, yeah was part of the decision making. So you don't have to be big. And like you, you collaborate as well. So you're a great collaborator. In fact, collaborations brought us together, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes, COVID. Yes. So collaborate. Absolutely. So you don't have to be a big company. I mean, you just you just showed Michael how you did it, beating uh, some big end of town out because you you did the pre the the, you know, the subject matter knowledge you have, but also show what it would be like to work with uh, with you going forward. I love that. So, so Rob, you really raised another great important point about collaboration. There needs to be collaboration internally. There's no longer this working in isolation. Everything has to be done cross-functionally yes. because fundamentally to succeed in B2B, to succeed in business, it's about three things. What you deliver, how you deliver, how you promote and engage. Thereby, by virtue of those three things, you need to be in working with marketing, sales, uh, customer service, customer success, your product teams, your operation teams, your client delivery teams, all of those folks need to be working together. So to your point, you can bring, you can have that front man person or front woman, that front person in the initial conversation, but you need to be engaging and bringing in those other people to demonstrate. So how is it going to work in terms of how, what project managers, you know, who on the client side do we need to introduce them to? How are they going to work together? All of that interaction, both internally within your company as a product service provider, as well as with your clients and customers, there has to be this uh, collaboration and more co-creation with your clients now as well. Yes. It's quite, yes. It, it's quite critical. Um, customer co-creation is a great way to really win because you can do something with a large organization. In fact, um, Gareth and his company, the Evolve Group, did some work with Coles in terms of co-creating a solution which they developed for them, and then we're able to scale and roll out and take it to other businesses, other markets as well. So co-creation is a win-win for both the client organization, but also the SME as part of their growth strategy as well. 
You know, Michael, co-creation, and it sounds like a buzzword, and it sounds like you and I are at the top of our game. You know, when I, you know, when I, I first came across co-creation, now you thought 97 was aging you, but let me give you my one. So my first co-creation, I must say when I was very, 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 very young, was actually 1986 when I used the first Apple computer, you know, the kind of box Mac, yeah. when I was at KPMG. And that was co-creation because that that particular, that was the first ever corporate deal done by Apple, done by Steve Jobs with the partnership with KPMG globally, where he said, what is holding you back in your business? And they said, you know, audit, we're going through all this kind of stuff. And so they built the Mac, a Mac that had a highly customized operating system and set of floppy disks in those days and a little tiny hard drive minuscule your iphone's like 10 times the capacity that was built for them to streamline the audit process and that just blew me away because and and luckily i got to work for apple later on and we used to do that and i saw how we how apple did it and i was in the labs of cupertino with some large corporates we were there two years before products came out asking them what would they like to see? We were at this point in time and the designers and guys are far more sophisticated than I am, but they were showing where they'd got to and they were asking my clients who are large enterprise customers, what would they like to see as a large enterprise global brand? What would they like to see in an Apple product? Well, you know, when you do co-creation, those, those customers were now enrolled. Yes. They were like, hey, you know, they were going back to their teams going, hey, you see that switch there? That was on the left-hand side. But when I went to Cupertino, it's on the right-hand side. Right, but but Apple also happened to extract ten thousand units when they <laughs> decided to do that, you know, because but it was co-creation. It was hundred percent win-win. Yes, and that's what and I love about co-creation. It is hundred percent win-win, and I just want to add to that though, Rob, that co-creation is not solely for a product or a technical uh, um, environment. Yes. It also applies in the service context as well. So you can be a service provider, an accounting firm, or consulting firm, working with your clients to develop the right kind of. Uh, uh, workshop programs, engagement programs, um, training and reporting. It's about working together with your customers yeah. and it can be done in a service context as well as a product context. And it can really help uh, build longevity in terms of gaining more business with those existing clients, gaining referrals, and also giving you products and service offerings that you can potentially roll out, modify and scale and take to other markets. So it's applicable in products and services. And you don't need to have a lot of money necessarily up front. It's really about getting the necessary people in the room or via Zoom room yes. and you know, having those discussions um, and, and getting on board and working together uh, towards a specific goal. I, I love that. I mean, I think, you know, when you say that, I just recall, I think that's probably what you and I've been doing co-creation in services for probably many, many years, probably over a, de- <laughs> a, decade, a decade now, I think about it. Um, I want to pick up on a point though, because one of the things I've been listening to is a number of um, CEOs and, and leaders in this co-creation space. And I'll be interested in your view on this because they're saying that one of the downsides of COVID has been the difficulty in doing really good co-creation over a Zoom. And, and that one of the, while there's lots of stuff we can do working from home, there's lots of stuff we can do in terms of Zoom, Teams, WebExes and the like. They said that one of the, one of the, um, the, the services, I guess, or one of the um, sort of, uh, factors of doing business, co-creation, like actually working up in a partnership with a, with a, a customer or a client, is actually more difficult in this as opposed to whiteboarding, you know, strategizing. What are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you agree that's been, a, been one of the more tougher things? So when we actually come away from working from home, that'll be one of the things we do go back to offices for? Uh, I totally agree, Rob. Look, nothing replaces face face-to-face and, and co-creation it is about all about ideally face-to-face getting into you, your workshops you know your innovation labs working together in that face-to-face environment but it can be done um, in this remote environment again for certain product contexts they're going to be a bit more challenging but it really Rob it's about I think a couple of things one it's about the culture that you have within your organization because if you have the right kind of uh, culture around empowering people, um, in being innovative, being inclusive, then that can still happen. And the reality is, and a lot of the experts have been saying that in terms of engagement, we all have to step up our game to, um, you know, to make up for um, the inadequacies that the likes of this Zoom does provide. So 
when you're doing briefings, workshops, um, speaking, you really have to raise, we all have to step up our game to uh, facilitate and really make that engagement happen and making sure you have the right kinds of processes that uh, will exist after you've had the Zoom, you know, brainstorming sessions, et cetera, so that the circulation of ideas and follow through does occur. Yeah, and I think we're going to see technology help with that, Michael, to be honest, because uh, the reality is, uh, well, you and I agree, the face-to-face is there. We're, we're just not going to be able to do that as efficiently as we want it in certain markets and uh, countries. It's going to be really tough. But what I'm also seeing is us starting to collaborate and and that growth mindset you talked about, you must have it. But you, know, you and I were talking off air, and I was talking to you about a particular solution I've seen now, which has been used in tertiary education. Right, for teaching. And, and I think that's got great value for both for you and I in terms of collaboration. Those, you know, virtual whiteboards, the sketching that we can do. Well, that, well, you know, when you think about it, tertiary education has been doing that for years before COVID. Just to, yeah, you, and I, you and I didn't look at it because that's not the space we were in. So I think that we're now starting to all go, well, what industry does do this well? well, well who's been doing this well? Um, and so I think that's one of the other things we're going to do. Plus, we're seeing the technology now change where they're realizing. So I was um, doing some work with Cisco earlier this year, and they were telling me now that they're now hosting, this is just WebEx, right? They're hosting 4 million meetings a day. Wow. Globally. Yeah. They were nowhere near this, you know, and, and, and yeah, WebEx is one element. Then there's Zoom and Teams uh, on top of that and many others, but that's just phenomenal that they they are scrambling. I think Zoom released today, I don't know if you saw a Zoom release, the paid webinar type thing that they've released just today, it's coming out. So we're going to see technology I think, come our way to help us out. Yeah, one question, you've got a um, number of clients and through COVID though, what, what, have, what have you, um, I won't say best or worst, but what have you seen some of your, some clients do that's been really good? Uh, and you either probably had some others who didn't do things so well, and maybe it might get back to leaders. So what are you seeing leaders do that's really working? And what is some other things that others who aren't doing things that maybe they should be? Anything that jumps out at you? Um, I would have to say, great question, Rob. I've seen some of my clients, uh, I think of one client in Ottawa, Palladium Insurance, an insurance provider, news provider in Ottawa. Their team have been very, were very quick on the pulse once the uh, pandemic hit in Ottawa to be very responsive. First of all, looking after their staff, getting their staff working remotely, making sure they were all equipped and making sure they put processes in place to be uh, liaison with their teams uh, and, you know, getting them all set up with appropriate laptops, et cetera, at home. And then um, they really really started with engaging uh, with their clients, going throughout their client base and checking in, finding out where clients were at, what they needed. Um, so they're very good on the pulse with that. I mean, I do have to give kudos to uh, Palladium, to um, led by Tim and Sylvie, uh, as they are very much big believers of listening and client engagement. So that's very much part of the culture of the yes. organization. That, that helps to have that culture early on, yeah. doesn't it? So yeah. they really just kind of just ramped it up and yep. took it to, uh, to, the, to the next level. Uh, so I've seen quite a bit of that. Um, with other service providers, really seeing them to take their offerings or engagement and their programs online. Yes. Uh, so I've seen uh, quite a bit of that as, as well. Tell me about, I just, you just mentioned a couple of people, because I think that um, uh, there's leadership and then there's what leaders do, which is a verb, not a noun. And so you, you mentioned Tim and Sylvie there. What, what, what did they do? So they're obviously the leaders there. What, what did, did they do and what was their communication like when, when COVID hit? Um, their communication was very much, um, they're, they're, I mean, I mean, being an SME, it, it, it's fairly easy for you to really, you know, get out and, you know, get on the, you know, get on the phone, get on Zoom and talk to your staff. So they are very quick to really have very personal engagement with, with their teams right away. And so having, authenticity was big, clearly. Yes, authenticity is very big. Um, and, you know, they're very big on that. They're very big about, you know, um, transparency, communication. So really just taking the um, principles that are existing within their company and really just, again, just kind of ramping it up and taking it to the next, uh, to the next level. And it's easier to do when those foundation principles, that's how you run the business anyways, then it's, it's not as such a dramatic shift. Sure, they had a lot to do because they had lots of inquiries from lots of clients asking about various things, corporate clients asking about, you know, cybersecurity, what do we need to be doing? And they were very responsive and got customer service teams to address that. But they had a lot of the foundation in place right. and the culture of how they run the organization, so uh, how they run Palladium. So it was really easy for them to, yeah, like I said, to really crank it up a notch as you need to be doing uh, when we are going to be in the sole online uh, environment of engagement and interaction and and what about salespeople what have you what have you seen the best salespeople doing during this period 
Um, salespeople, I'm seeing a little bit of a mixed bag from what I've seen. Um, some are reaching out to clients and really trying to be quite helpful and trying to see how they can help their clients and giving them information and guidance. Um, I think there is a degree of folks aren't sure really what to be, what they should be doing. Um, I do a lot of monitoring, Rob, uh, to see what, you know, what a lot of the experts and what are the thought leaders saying. Um, and in the B2B space, that is where um, selling has been a, an area that we really need to step up our game. Uh, there was a recent study that showed, I think it might have been actually by Gardner Hinge Group, one of the big groups in the U.S. anyhow, which was showing how really sellers are really falling off on two key areas around listening and doing adequate needs discovery. So to really understand in depth what do the decision makers and what do the leaders want, they've really fallen short on that. And coincidentally, when they ask business buyers what they're looking for, they're looking for product and service providers that can listen, that do in-depth needs discovery, and can provide them with recommendations to move forward. Um, so there is still, I think, overall, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done across the B2B sphere generally in terms of really stepping up, in terms of those, you know, listening, that depth of the discovery, and really leveraging that to work with your clients to develop that roadmap. That is still something that's really not being done overall, um, holistically, if, if I'm going to do a broad brush across the B2B sales and marketing domain. Yeah, Michael, I would think it's also now being heightened, highlighted even more as this decision making has gone up, as we talked about earlier. So if there was a problem beforehand, there's a big problem now, right? Because yeah. that those buyers are now saying, I, I'm just not getting that confidence you pull into from the, I'm, he, I'm hearing a lot, I'm seeing a lot, I got a lot of stuff coming at me, but they're not talking my language. And you know, I, and it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, a leader spoke to me the other day and she, she called me, she said, you know, um, Rob, I really think I need to, I want to increase the business acumen of my people. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what she meant, right? I need to increase, not, not the product knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not the level of how to work with procurement, not the levels, but I need to get the business acumen. In other words, what is the effect of our product service or solution on this organization? You know, does it help them move faster? Does yeah. it help them uh, lead their remote teams better? Uh, will it give me accelerated return and by when? And, and if you're not familiar, I mean, I've got, you know, that's my accounting background it comes out of me. I'm not an accountant, um, but it comes out of me that I kind of get it. Like I get how a CFO thinks and I get how a CEO thinks. And, you know, confidence is just, just goes hand in glove with risk mitigation. Yes, you're, you're spot on, Rob. And again, that goes back to that, you know, fundamental characteristic around B2B is that you must be buyer driven. And I'm very big on that. You must be buyer driven. Yeah. You have to speak their language. You yeah. have to speak the language of those in the boardroom because those who might be purchasing your biotech solution, your engineering solution, they may not use it, may not care about it, but they do have KPIs that they are trying to uh, address. And you always have to show what is the link between your product solution, whatever it is, and how it's going to help them meet their objectives around increasing yeah. revenues, decreasing costs and risk, and in this environment as well, increase of safety, quality, and convenience. Those kinds of broad business drivers and priorities that you need to show the link, the bridge, how your product or solution is going to help contribute to, do, to that. Features and benefits, that comes secondary. It's really totally, about yeah. And I think now, um, you know, for all of us now, any, any metrics that matter that you had pre-COVID, you need to recheck in. So even if you're, you've done a great discovery in February, I would suggest it's irrelevant. I would suggest that you need to go back to that CEO and they will thank you for it too, by the way. They're just going to be super busy. They're not going to ring you up and go, oh, by the way, Mike, we've changed our KPIs. Would you like a new copy? Right? They're not going to send that out to you. You need to call back up and go, look, last is checking in. And I think what I've found in some of the best B2B people, they're, not, they're, they're, they're checking in with value right? They're checking mm -hmm. in with insight. They're coming back and going, look, I want to check in. So here you're going. I know last time we spoke about your goals for the first 12 months were da, 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 da. I just want to know, is that targeted now or are you guys shifted? And I, nine times out of 10, it's like, well, guess what? That's on hold. <laughs> it's now a three month window. It's not 12. We can't even think that far, that type of thing. And that, that's what I've found. And I found some of the, and, and uh, it's, again, it's confidence, Michael. You talk about the confidence, giving the buyer confidence. I think that the salespeople have to have confidence to ask that question and to be confident that, that listening is actually, is, is actually a really good thing to do. Talking less is actually good. Uh, 
Rob, you've, you've raised a number of important points there. Number one, listening is, is critical. It is fundamental. Um, that it needs to become the key part of, because we're in this time now, I'm calling it the business restart now, where we're all looking to restart and move forward for the rest of 2020, 2021. Listening has to be your fundamental number one activity. And you raise another point as well in terms of as you're about to approach decision makers, because you do need to check back in to understand where they're at. You need to go into those discussions, even if it's a 15 minute Zoom call, you need to go armed and ready. You need to have done some of your other listening, you know, having listened to webinars, read some research reports. You need to know what's going on in the industry, have a point of view, have some insight, uh, perhaps some recommendations to go into those meetings with to help facilitate the discussion. It's not just about going and saying, Rob, what keeps you up at night? It's going in and say, Rob, I know you're not sleeping because of A, B, and C. Have you considered X, Y, and Z? Um, Oh, and I read this, and this is what's looking to happen in first quarter of 2021 um shall we have a chat about it so you have to give value and insight uh right from the very beginning even before that first discussion now it's not about coming up and saying what's wrong what's keeping you up or not you have to go in informed armed and ready because your buyers are informed armed and ready in fact they have so much information more they need to do that's so not what they need, is it? I, I really like that. In fact, I, that question, what keeps you awake at night, has driven me nuts for so many years. Uh, and a good friend of mine who's at Microsoft in the US, she just put a post on LinkedIn about say how much that question drives her nuts because uh, she used to answer it was her kids mostly when they were young. But, you know, it's like, because it's, it just shows you, to me, when, it's, when, it, when and if so many of else is out there using that question or you had a, a sales guru who clearly isn't as skilled as Michael is telling you about, hey, this is a great question, ask what keeps you awake at night. That's a lazy salesperson's, right question that says to the buyer i have done no research whatsoever on you how about you tell me everything all right that's that's literally what that that comes across yeah and you cannot do that anymore rob you cannot do that anymore you have to go in and saying i think what is keeping you up at night is x and y and then have some suggestions insights um, potential opportunities you know what are some red flags you have to go in and deliver value right from that first phone call right from that first zoom meeting you've got to give value to get value but you have to do that that work up front yeah. oftentimes folks say i don't have time for that it, it's critical now you're not going to get cut through uh with your fellow smes with the larger end of town with buyers full stop if you do not do your homework yet. it's a whole different game now you don't have time not to do that it has you know? to be part i mean I, I, part of your 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 reason for being it's part yeah. of your key activity you and, and here's the thing you know it's not even new i mean i went through ibm sales school right which is fundamental I, st- I still have the books for it and i was it's still one of the best and and when you were doing ibm sales school right this is before crms and the like they literally had a formula that showed through research that 15 minutes you know 10 to 15 minutes on client research client thinking client prep before the meeting saved you 30 minutes of an extended off on tangents meeting with the customer and the customer actually thanked you for saving the time. They said it was like you earned more money. They had a better meeting, and the NPS went up if you're doing that kind of scoring. It like it was, and that was. And they said, "So this is how we roll. And if you don't want to roll like that, you don't have to work for us either." That was the way they put it. You know, every IBM, right? It's just like that or that. But I, I remember reading it, and you look through the data, and you go, "Actually, this makes a whole lot of sense." And here we are, 20 years later, and we're still saying it. But we get people who say, "I don't have time to prepare." I've, I don't have, you know, I'm going to go in there and wing it because I'm, I'm a Zen salesperson. I like to be in the moment, you know. And you can't do that now because one of the key characteristics, which Tom and I are going to be discussing this afternoon, is about the whole self-diagnosis and self-research of business buyers. They're very well informed. They have been going on lots of Zoom meetings, talking to their colleagues, going to lots of mastermind groups. So they're, they're very armed and ready now. And so when you are coming in to have discussions, you need to be doing a lot more than 15 or 30 minutes worth of research because Whoa. they know their, they know their stuff very, very well now. Uh, Michael, you've, you've raised a great point here. And you've also raised my good friend, Tom Williams. So I hope he's going to be listening to this. So Tom, Tom, thank you for bringing Michael and I together because Tom's a great collaborator and uh, uh, it'd be fantastic. And uh, there'll be a great call when you speak to Tom. Um, one of the interesting things you raised just then was the marketing side. So, he, so this is what I'm seeing as well. If you're a salesperson and you're not running that webinar and you're not on that panel and you're not writing that blog and you're not part of that early research, which your educated buyer is tapping into, then that's a problem. That's my view. I think that you, the salespeople now need to be firmly in the marketing uh, trenches and whether they're 
writing a piece for marketing or as part of a, a guest on a webinar somewhere, or a podcast like you and I are doing here, salespeople in B2B today have got to go further and further up, up the, the early stages in that marketing sales to me. If it's not blended and fully integrated today, it just, it just, it just can't be separated. That's my view. I don't know if you, you're you're absolutely right. Um, it does very much need to be blended. Um, I've seen some emerging business models now where uh, seen it more in some of the US markets where now marketing and sales are now called revenue operations. So you have the head of oper and it's marketing and sales together. And in B2B, they have to work together. There's no longer these silos because your marketing team will be often responsible for doing a lot of your buyer enablement, generating those right kinds of content and working with the sales team to deliver them. And you need to be having account plans, strategic account planning, which needs to be done collaboratively. So yeah. marketing and sales, I would say marketing, sales, customer success, it's, it's cross-functional now. So you can, yeah. the silos days are over. And those that can do the integration and collaboration, those are the ones that will be able to win. Yeah, I love that. And I think the term I've also seen bounded around is this thing of CRO. So client, if you want to, client or customer revenue optimization. So it's it's making sure we're, we're providing things uh, profitably because if we're not profitable, then we can't support our customer. And yeah. and so a lot of that, it also becomes down to, um, you know, making sure you're working with the right customers that fit your business. You know, I think that that's something I see people uh, don't do enough of they, they salespeople will especially you know are remunerated sometimes the wrong way to fill the funnel um and if you want to fill the funnel well that's what you'll get a full funnel it won't be a profitable one or a healthy one but you'll get what you ask for yeah. and so i think these days that you're having understanding who is the right client for the type of business you do is so critical do, do you agree with that just i, I fully agree it, that's fundamental and that really needs to become the one of the foundation starting point for the company's overall business strategy is you know who are we going to serve what is our is that ideal client profile uh, what does that look like and so you need to be getting clarity on that you need to be getting alignment on that and then you'll need to take that uh, ideal client profile distill that down to a a customer level to a buyer level and then that's where the strategic account planning that customer planning will come in again but it all starts that you need to have clarity as to where to focus so coming back to my where, where what industries market and customers you will serve get clarity and agreement on on that what does that look like then we will take that next down to the customer level and we get into strategic account planning and all that but you fundamentally need to be doing that up front and that requires listening to get that clarity as to who you should be serving and who everyone across the organization is working to serve. Yeah, I like that one. I mean, across the organization and you, know, you and I were in startups and I think in those cultures, it was so much easier, wasn't it? Because everyone was in, we we're all in. Uh, you know, a lot of people had equity or um, different share plans. And so you had a, a culture of people wanting to be successful. And I always found it really difficult um, in those early days of startups, when you brought a new hire in, you kind of wanted them, are they like us? Are they, are they going to be as motivated and ex as excited for customers as we are? And th that scales well. You can still do it in large organizations, but you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be intentional about it. I find that people, um, you know, if you're a salesperson, uh, you know, you've got to really understand who's your equivalent uh, level in product, in uh, pricing, in legal, you know, uh, in, in finance, um, in marketing, and get to know those people because they, they actually, especially if you're working on large accounts or large accounts for your business, uh, they become so critical because there's there's so many touch points. You know, it's not just the sales team, it's the finance team, it's an, and any one of those, it's like that, it's like that chain, isn't it? It, it, it? A weak link, you know, you can have everything going really well, but if the finance team are just not returning phone calls or sending demand, <laughs> demand letters and, you're, and you've sent out your NPS score, Hey, yeah. how do you rate us? And all of a sudden they get the third on demand letter for something that you didn't actually sell them or there was a problem with credit or something. It can sink the whole ship. And so I think team cell, uh, you know, I like to call it team cell. I've always been a believer in it. as much as you can is just so important these days, more so than ever. Uh, 100% agree, Rob. You call it team cell. I, I, it, I call it around working collaboratively. Uh, in my corporate days, I introduced at my last corporate role, I introduced the concept of strategic customer workshops, um, which are, um, which are cross-functional teams. So mm -hmm. we'll bring together the appropriate people from marketing, sales, product, operations, finance, uh, and then we would have uh, on your counterpart for your key customers, those similar people and having this cross-functional uh, half-day workshop to understand, we understand needs and priorities, yes. what's going on, and then working through and getting action plans as to what needs to be done across the organization, prioritizing, and then having everyone working across um, 
across the various elements in conjunction with the overarching, you know, customer uh, uh, and like, key account goals that you have. So that there has to be that collaborative effort and yeah. doing things like those cross-functional workshops need to be done more than ever now to have that uh, collaborative uh, working together because it's one customer. We have, the, within our organizations, you may have different departments, but from a customer point of view, they see it as one organization. So if there's disjoint between what product's doing, what customer service is doing, what the sales team is doing, that's on you as a product service provider because customers, business buyers don't see that, see it that way. You're one organization. Yeah. So you, have, you either have it together or you don't. And they don't care what, they don't care how you reorged. They don't care what <laughs> you, <laughs> your new segment that. was called. But I love that. Mike. And I, I, I love that. Um, I used to call them, uh, still call them actually, you know, cultural alignment sessions, you know, just to, because I think this day and age as well, as you're selling in there, don't make the assumption that your customer is aligned internally. Right. Again. So your customer can be, you know, their product marketing or whoever there's going to be your implementation. They can be quite misaligned, even more so now they're working remotely. I mean, we don't make the assumptions because now they're not around the water cooler. They're not having those discussions that we're getting with Gibbs and Michael today. What should we talk about? That's not happening. Don't make the assumption. So I think there's love those cultural alignment. But you know, the other thing I like about them, though, Michael, is the diversity of thought. Yes. The diversity of people and thinking. And I, I remember being in one and, and they weren't. I, they're all going along. They're all saying yes. And I just knew this and I know I had to do something. And I, and we just threw it. We just put a, an extra kind of question in there about, and kind of put a, we threw a curveball at them and it was fantastic because they all started arguing. Right. And that was, that was great because when we started arguing, we started giving our passions and our feelings out and they argued and jossed around. But gee, at the end of the day, they were high-fiving, they were excited. They, they vented a little bit, you know, internally. Uh, they felt good because we we brought that together. We brought them back. That's the that's the skill of the facilitator, by the way. Don't let it get out of control. But we brought it back because diversity of thinking is just so important today to have this different view and have that person in your room who goes, hey, why don't we do that? And everyone goes, oh, that'll never work. Yeah. You, know, you need that person. It's critical to have diversity within your teams in terms of, you know, experiences, different industries from different markets, because the world is global. You know, some of your leading companies who are doing great uh, and creative, very innovative things, they haven't done the traditional, you know, I did my MBA, I worked at a consultant. They're coming, either coming from and leveraging diverse experiences, um, ideas. So you have to bring that diversity of thought now. We have diversity of customers, diversity of businesses. So we have to have that and build that within our teams, within our companies, so that we can um, thrive and compete in a very diverse and highly competitive world that we're in now. Yeah. Hey, look, we've talked about a lot of companies um, and we said we wouldn't use this word much, pivoting. So we're going to use it one more time and that, that's it. Um, what have you done though, personally, Michael? What have you done in pivoting, you know, your, um, your, your practice? Have you done much that was different from March till now? Uh, yes, I have actually, Rob. So at the beginning of the year, January, February, if you say, you know, listen, innovate, grow, I was servicing startups and SMEs and I was probably doing a bit of a mix, you know, 65, 30, face-to-face -face versus online. Um, you know, once the borders shut here in Australia, because I was doing work for the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, and once, you know, um, you know the borders were shut, uh, fundamentally, no startups were going overseas. So the international landing pro program kind of came to a halt. So I've made a pivot to really go back to my core roots of working with SMEs. So my focus is solely on SMEs now. Um, I'm now operating pretty much, I'd say, 98% online. Um, I'm also doing a lot more work globally. That was always my intention at the beginning of the year. It's really ramped up so exponentially. Uh, so a lot of the workshops um, and everything is online. And I've developed a coaching program, which is online uh, to work remotely to be servicing SME CEOs and their, and their teams. So yeah, so I've done quite the pivot in terms of being much more focused in terms of uh, the who I serve, um, a bit of diversification from a marketing perspective, because I'm now doing live streams, I'm doing a lot more podcasts, being a bit more creative with some of the content, being more executive engagements and workshops. Um, so those are some of the things that I've been doing in terms of pivoting. And then my core offerings now are online uh, in terms of workshops and advisory programs, as opposed to rolling up sleeves and, you know, doing the customer interviews. I'm now out helping to create those implementation roadmaps and, and, and uh, to how to move forward. Yeah, it's which affected us all, hasn't it? Now you talked about getting back to your being back to your core. If I could take you in the time machine back to fifteen year old Michael, what would you tell fifteen year old Michael about 
what's coming up and what to think about? Um, I would say 15 year old Michael, don't be so hard on yourself because I've always been known to be my worst critic and the most demanding on myself. Um, I think even until to this day, 2020, it's still probably applicable, <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest. But I would say, yeah, don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah, because I've always been known to be my worst critic. Um, yeah. I think that's very true. And I always say, you know, don't be hard on yourself because there's other professionals who'll do it for you for free, right? Mm, yeah, <laughs> no point you doing it, right? Better, better people than you that can be way harder and critical on you, and they love it. Um, now, we want to find out about a lot, lot more about Michael. Um, where do we go to? What's the best place to find out more about Michael Haynes and all you do? Okay, so two places. So in terms of if you're looking for information, advice, resources as an SME, go to my website, listeninnovategrow.com. So there's videos, there's articles, there's checklists. I've created a free uh, toolkit, Deciphering the Business Buyer. It's a PDF. It's only about five pages, which will show you how to prepare for those discovery sessions. So all of that's at listeninnovategrow.com. Fantastic. And then you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn because I'm very active on LinkedIn uh, as well and more than happy to to connect as well because love to engage that's how you and i met that's how i've met tom so yes i'm always up for engaging and collaborating as well fantastic michael so excited to have you on the program today you and i could have talked for hours we'll have to we'll have to do it again uh, at some point you say hi to tom for me today that's uh, we'll really excited to uh, hear you guys in action and uh it's been fantastic and we'll talk to you again great thanks for having me it's been a pleasure rob hey thanks for listening and we hope you enjoyed this episode Please subscribe and rate the podcast you listen to so we can continue to serve and inspire others. Remember, connect to us on all the social media channels. The Out of the Possible podcast is hosted by me, Rob Hartnett, and produced by Finn Hartnett. Connect with us directly on LinkedIn, Rob hyphen Hartnett, H-A-R-T-N-E-T-T, and Finn Hartnett. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.